Hello there and welcome to this video all about compression algorithms. A few students have requested this and we're going to go through the basics of compression today and we're going to run through a couple of algorithms that you need to know for your A-level. So the first thing to talk about is compression and what it's all about. Well compression means reducing the amount of file space in bytes that a given file takes up and you need to think why might we need to compress files. Now files can be anything from text files to images or it could be audio for example or even video. And the goal is to remove unnecessary bits to reduce the overall number of bits in the file. And nowadays, modern systems, it's all about sending or transferring over the internet. Now, why is this such a big issue? Because in the past, compression was very important. And that's because computer memory with the old magnetic tapes and large um, devices that we use, they were very, very expensive. Whereas nowadays, you can pick a hard drive up fairly cheap. Um, so SSD, solid state has now come down in price for example and it's not really about what we're storing it on and the cost of storing it anymore it's more about the transfer so that means a smaller file size means fewer bits to transmit so therefore faster transmission is achieved and again this is becoming more and more obsolete because as transmission gets faster and improved with optical cables for example these things are improving all the time. However, there is always a need for compression when we're sending over the internet in modern systems. So let's talk about how compression works and how it all fits together. The first thing to talk about is compression ratios. So a compression ratio is the level of compression that is measured. And what we do when we talk about compression ratios is we talk about the size of the compressed file divided by the size of the original file, and that will give us a compression ratio. And these ratios sit between 0 and 1, and the closer the ratio is to 0, the tighter the compression. Now, we can't really achieve 0, because that means we'll completely compress it and it'll disappear. So, you're looking for a number between 0 and 1. 1 being the original file size, and 0 being no, no data, no bits, or anything like that at all. And you might have seen some of these pieces of software, such as WinZip and WinRAR and 7-Zip. Their job is to basically compress files down, and each one of them will achieve slightly comp different compression ratios because they all have different algorithms working. And if you've studied at GCSE, Computer Science at GCSE, you will know about lossy and lossless compression. Now, I don't know if you'll be able to see this on the video. Um, these videos are HD, so you might be able to see some of these, uh, the quality difference in these. But basically, the higher up our compression, or the more compression we apply, the worse our images tend to get. And the, there's a difference here between lossy and lossless. Lossy is a algorithm, or a compression um, algorithm that we apply, and it actually loses quality of pixel. So the higher the compression ratio, the worse off our image tends to be. So we can have an original image on the left there with the bird on the branch, and on the right-hand side, we've compressed it slightly, and the quality starts to get worse. And lossy is all about removing different bits from our um, files so that we can... We, we don't really notice an effect, but you do notice an effect as you crank up the, um, the compression. Now, lossless is completely different. Lossless compression is all about building back the file in its original state, so you don't actually lose any bits. And there's a number of different algorithms that we're going to look at to show you that there. So let's run through a couple of points on lossy compression then. So the algorithm looks at the data and tries to identify the patterns and decide how much it can throw away without noticeably affecting the quality of the data. And these lossy compression, uh, lossy compression is always irreversible, so you can never go back to the original. Once it's removed and it's compressed, you can't get those pixels or that data back again. And it's used mainly in image compression, although you can use it in sound and video as well. And lossy compression always involves the loss of quality. So the higher up your uh, compression, the worse off, or the higher degradation that's going to be or have. And that's just a fact of life. So we, tr we don't tend to use lossy all that much because we want to keep the state or the original state of the image. And for that, you're going to need lossless compression. 
So with lossless compression, every bit of data originally in the file remains after it's uncompressed. And all the information is restored and nothing is lost at all. So all the bits are exactly the same like the original that you compressed in the first place. And it makes for a preferred method of compression. With this method, although the file sizes are reduced, the reduction is less compared to the reduction of using lossy compression. So lossy will always achieve much more compression because you're actually removing and deleting data, whereas lossless compression will reduce a little bit, but not as much as lossy in most cases. Now, if we compare these two together, lossy compression results in a significantly reduced file size, whereas lossless keeps the quality of the file. So you can reduce it slightly, but not as much as lossy. So there's a trade-off here between how much data dupe are you prepared to lose, or do you need to keep the original data at the sacrifice of less compression? The disadvantage with lossy is that it also results in quality loss, which may not be acceptable for some applications or for some users. And the drawback um, on the lossless side, the drawback of this compression technique is that larger file sizes are required to maintain the post-compression quality of all the original data. So what we're going to do now is we're going to have a look at a, at a couple of lossless compression algorithms. And that's because it's covered in our specification. So here, with something called run length encoding, this works well for um, repeated characters. And we, we see this in everyday life, so for example, the sequencing of DNA, or even our um, binary machine code. If we're sending binary machine code, we're going to have lots of repeated characters um, or numbers, so lots of zeros and lots of ones, for example. Now, it doesn't typically happen in the English language, but when we look at things like DNA sequencing with a certain um, range of characters, we do get a lot of uh, replication, and we can we can compress that down using run length encoding. So the point of run length encoding is that it replaces a sequence of repeated characters with a flag character. Now think about a flag character. If you have a comma separated value list in Excel, for example, all of the data is separated by a comma. And that's the flag that tells us where one word starts and one word ends. So a flag character could be anything we like. It could be a, an exclamation mark, a dollar symbol, for example. And that's followed by the character itself and the number of times it is repeated. So let me show you an example then. So here we go. So we've got all those Bs in a single line. So if you look there, we've got nine Bs in total. If we were to apply run length encoding, it would become dollar sign B9. So the dollar is the flag. B is the character we want to replicate, and the number is how many times we want the B to be replicated. So the file size is reduced from 9 bytes down to 3 bytes, because each character is a byte in itself. And that's a big saving. So bear in mind, we don't compress sequences of letters that are shorter than 4, because we have 3 characters for the one for the flag, one for the characters that's being replicated, and then the third one is for how many times you want it to be replicated. So anything less than four simply has no cost benefit. And to show you what I mean by that, let's take an example. So here's our example. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six A's, three N's. We've got our um, eight B's, it looks like, I think, if I can count. Yeah, and two U's and a B and a Y and an E. So that would turn out to be dollar sign A6 because we've got six A's. We've got three N's. And remember, anything less than four, we just don't bother with. So we've leave them as three single N's on their own. Then we've got eight B's. So dollar sign for the flag B replicated eight times. We've got U and U, again, less than four, so we leave it alone. And then BYE, again, is less than four, so we leave it alone. No repeated characters at the end. So you can see there, just by looking at it visually, we have reduced the number of characters included in our file. And that's the point of run length encoding. Another encoding, um, another lossless compression technique that we use is something called dictionary encoding. So dictionary encoding is another form of lossless compression. 
and a dictionary of commonly occurring sequences of characters is created. So think of it like a dictionary, okay? An actual dictionary. How do you find a letter in a dictionary? Well, you go to that group first, if whatever the letter is, you go to that group, then you find the word you're looking for. So in the text, these sequences are replaced by pointers to the relevant place in the dictionary, like an index. And the references are shorter than the words they replace, and therefore that saves us bytes in our file. So creating the dictionary is simply a case of scanning the document to find the most common words and assigning a reference to each. Now that first step of scanning the whole document is quite important, because if you look at this example here with our famous Jingle Bells um, song here, you've got Jingle Bells, Jingle Bells, Jingle All The Way. If what, what, what the computer will do is it will scan it all first and it will put the most common appearing word would go with the smallest binary value. So here, Jingle occurs six times in this text and therefore it has a binary value of 0, 0, 0, 0. And that's the lowest cost, isn't it? So the most common gets the smallest number. And again, that saves us bytes. And then we go through the, the list and we go, well, Bells has four. So that's the next most commonly occurring. And that gets the, the binary value of 0, 0, 0, 1. And so on and so forth. Now, I didn't complete all the words in the table because I ran out of space and you know time, etc. But that's how dictionary encoding works. Now, for your exam, you're expected to just be aware of them and basics of how it operates. You don't need to go into the ins and outs of everything with these encoding methods. The next algorithm I'm going to show you is something called Huffman encoding. And again, this is another um, lossless data compression algorithm. And the idea is to assign variable length codes to input characters. And the length of the assigned codes are based on the number of times that they appear in the text. So the most frequent characters get the smallest code and the least frequent characters get the largest code. And again, that's all to save space. So here, if we take pineapple and banana, and this is an example that we've taken from Computing at Schools, which did a very good video, you should check that out, on the Huffman encoding. But we've got pineapple and banana, and we've basically said that we're going to take the characters we've used instead of taking all the characters. So I've, I've, used, I've used P's, I's, N's, E, A, E's, A's, L's, underscores, which is space, and B's. And using those letters alone, I can just multiply them by how many times I've used them to, to create pineapple banana again. And already, we've gone down from 16 characters to 8. And the next thing to do then is to assign different bit patterns to each of the characters. So I assign 1 to P, 1, 0 to I, 1, 1 to N, etc, etc. Now if I said to you, what if I gave you a message of 1, 1, 1? What does that mean? Does that mean that you're going to take a P and an N? Because that's 1 for P and a 1, 1 for N. Or is it an N followed by a P? Or is it just a space, for example? Now that leads to ambiguity, which is interpreting something in more than one way. So who knows what it means? We need to remove this problem. And Huffman encoding does this by using a binary tree. So there are three steps to unambiguously sending information so that you or I or whoever else, the receiver, is able to decode this in the correct manner. And the first step is to build a priority queue. And that details the frequency that the letters occur. So P occurs three times, I occurs once, N occurs three times, etc, etc. Step two, we then create a binary tree to show how frequently they are used. And we build this binary tree from the bottom up. So, and the bottom is most frequent at the bottom to least frequent at the top. And then in step three, what we do is we traverse the tree. So depending on your traversal method will dictate how this Huffman encoding is actually produced. And that's as far as we need to go into this really with Huffman encoding. We've got a few different algorithms there now that we can discuss and we can describe. So the only thing to do really is just to make sure that we've got our compression definitions down. 
So when comparing compression algorithms, you need to consider the following factors. It's important to note that it's not worthwhile comparing lossy and lossless algorithms together because lossy will always reduce the file size more than lossless. And there's three different terms that we need to be aware of. So we've covered the compression ratio, which is the ratio between the original file and the new compressed file. Compression or decompression time, that's the amount of time it takes to compress or decompress a file. And sometimes size saving may be sacrificed for speed. So we might want something to be compressed or decompressed a little bit faster, and that might come at the cost to the size of compression. And then we've got our savings percentage. And the saving percentage is a percentage measure of how much smaller the compressed file is to or against the original that we compressed in the first place. So when compressing or using compression algorithms or comparing them, you need to consider the scenario that it will be used in. Okay, so if speed is critical or processing time is limited, then you may opt for a simpler algorithm which may not compress as efficiently. And that's a whistle-stop tour of the different compression algorithms that you need to think about for your A-level exam. And as always, I'll see you again soon.